Wojtek. That's how you pronounce my name. I don't know what these letters are, but that's the phonetic pronunciation. I'm a 3D generalist and a 3D printing enthusiast, and I'm a free Libre open, open source software user, mainly GIMP and Blender. Okay. Oh, and by the way, my uh, backups uh, file storage is by Autodesk. Long live soft image. <laughs> For the ones who understand the pun, it's dead. <laughs> Um, so what is 3D printing? What exactly is 3D printing? I will just try and uh, build on what Matteo just, just presented a minute ago. So it will be more like a base for what he was presenting. 3D printing is an additive method of manufacturing. So you build layer on layer, basically. Um, this allows uh, to have any complex stru structures built with no, it's, it's much easier to have complexity. It's, it's cheaper to have complexity using uh, complexity using uh, 3D printing uh, rather than normal traditional manufacturing. Okay, so I have a short video showing uh, how 3D printing works. Well, Matthew had a much better video, so you know, uh, and um, so the types of machines, I will tr focus in this presentation, I will focus on open source machines, so the FDM ones mainly, that's uh, fused deposition modeling, so uh, for example Ultimaker, uh, these ones are the most popular in the open source um, kind of community, maker community. Um, then we have the SLA, so these ones are the second one coming soon probably, the second cheapest ones, so that's uh, stereolithography. This is the, the second one, it's this one, they don't deposit plastic, more like they solidify a resin using ultraviolet light. Because the, the traditional, the one we use, FDM, which uh, are the most popular, with us, uh, they just deposit melted plastic layer by layer. Plastic or could do chocolate or metal. If you have, uh, let's say, metal that solidifies fast enough. And the SLS, the final one, uh, this is, um, <coughs> these are the most expensive, kind of the um, majority of the uh, current SLS printers. This is the uh, uh, laser sintering, uh, selective laser sintering uh, printers. They, they are very expensive, kind of in industry grade, and they cost uh, tens of thousands of euros at least, up to hundreds of thousands. The, 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 metal, the metal solid uh, uh, sintering printers, they are really expensive, you can print jewelry with. Uh, so I won't really talk about them, and uh, there are not many. There is one project I heard in uh, Texas, that that uh, they because the patents are expiring, so they are developing an open source one. But I don't see that uh, coming to our houses anytime soon, since uh, it's very dangerous. They use a very high power lasers, and you don't want to have that at home. Uh, jetting, by the way, jetting is uh, another type of um, another type of technology, 3D printing technology that's just. Um, being developed and it's um, not really mainstream yet, so I won't focus on that. It's just being okay. So a short, very short history. The first patent was by uh, Chuck Hall in 1984. Um, it was the stereolithography uh, patent. He's now the um, uh, owns the 3D systems. Uh, so that patent is the main patent, it's uh, expiring, and there, I mean, we might see some more arrivals in 3D printing this year, actually. Uh, okay, so the applications, uh, probably medicine is the main application for uh, 3D printing, the longest one, over 10 years, it's been in use, in, uh, especially in dentistry, for example, and um, replacement, uh, very recently, there's many, uh, there's, there are very many uh, reconstruction surgeries done with that. Uh, aerospace industry, uh, you can see uh, some parts in some jet engines or are 3D printed. Um, but it's not widely used, especially because it's, it's not very cheap and it's on for very s uh, small parts and vital parts. 
product design for prototyping, for example, whether you want to, if you want to develop uh, quickly within a day, uh, you have want, you have a concept design, you can design it, you can have it done within a couple of hours, for example, of a case, of something, and art, art which is probably the, with the, with us, with um, uh, enthusiasts, is probably the most prevalent use of 3D printing. It's just printing small trinkets and like keychains, like you can see here some of the stuff I printed. And let me just say what's the difference between 3D printing and additive manufacturing, because Vital is the same thing, but uh, it so happened that 3D printing is being used more as um, a kind of customer 3D printing. It's the, it's the Printing with uh, the low-end kind of printers, which we could have at home, and additive manufacturing is the uh, industry industry 3D printing, uh, which is uh, which has been used uh, for a very long time for for 20 years and so in um, the manufacturing industry. Okay, so this is a this is called Gartner's hype cycle curve, and. Uh, this is where we are currently with consumer 3D printing on the top. So we are at the peak of inflated expectations now, uh, people say, because there are a lot of expectations with 3D printing and people just, people start, people don't believe in 3D printing. Some people are just the naysayers. There's lots of people that just dismiss it straight away. Let's say it's just, uh, it's, it's that you cannot print everything, which is partially true, but uh, the, the Technology is being developed so fast that uh, there is there is a lot of a lot of a lot of possibilities with that, and uh, it's only up to us what we what's going to happen. In the enterprise 3D printing, which is the um, industry one, is actually uh, in the slope of enlightenment. So people just start realizing now what are the possibilities in 3D printing, especially medicine and um, product design, designing uh, for, me for uh, industry, you can have lighter parts, stronger parts, and more, more durable parts, and at the same time, you, uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can have a, your, your better designs which are uh, safe materials. Okay, so pros and cons. Most of that, most of them are already said. Already, so I'm just going to repeat quickly. So technology is improving. We'll see rise in um, in in possibilities and uh, new arrivals, especially materials, and uh, and the resolutions are going to increase. The printers that are coming out of them are cheaper and cheaper. Uh, it's waste free. The PLA polymer is bio biodegradable, so. Uh, it's, it's even their materials are food safe, um, and obviously it's a subtractive. Uh, I mean, it's not subtractive. It's additive method of, method of manufacturing, so you don't waste any materials. Uh, it's faster than molds. If you want to develop quickly, prototype something. Uh, if it's for for low low amount of manufacturing. If you want to manufacture a couple products as well, it's very good because you don't spend thousands of going through the whole process and make something in China. You have the freedom of creation and complexity is like, it's cheap, like I said, it's uh, and it's great community, of course. There is a, a very good community around 3D printing, especially in Blender, and in major cities you have uh, hacker spaces and lots of people just use Blender. And the, the cons, uh, as currently, the speed and resolution can be unsatisfactory, especially with the uh, lower end printers, the ones that are more affordable ones you can get for a couple hundred euros. Uh, limited number of materials, and it's always going to stay this way. There's some materials that you cannot, won't be able to print simply because of the prop properties. Um, the labor is expensive and education, and uh, it takes uh, quite some time to learn 3D printing for now, because the software is just not ready for um, for entry level kind of users, for for customers, for everyday person that wants to design. Uh, legal, legal implications, uh, that's one thing that's worth mentioning. For example, that what if you design a toy and you give it to someone, you sell it to someone, and who's going to be responsible if the, if the toy, if something happens to the child that uses this toy? For example, 
if it's dangerous, are you going? Are you are you going to be responsible for creating the designing the toy, or the person that manufactures it on their own printer, or the printer manufacturer? So it's not clear yet. Uh, and like I said, it's not for everyone requires requires patience. Yeah, these are some of my broken prints. There is some like Christmas ornaments you can see there, dead. Uh, so open source FDM 3D printers. So like I said, open source is at the heart of 3D printing. Open source 3D printing. Uh, that's how it started. The customer, uh, the customer kind of uh, 3D printing. This it started in 2008 uh, in the, during the Rebra, pro, Rebra project. Uh, it was started by makers, but pe people who want to create, create their own machines that can replicate themselves. So now you have. Uh, Many, many, many uh, splinters of that of that uh, technology. So the Reprap family has grown imm immensely. There's many different deltas, uh, Mendel. Uh, there's many machines that are there available. You can build yourself. You can download the files, and 25, 30, 40 percent of the printer you can basically you can print yourself, and then you just need to buy the mechanical parts, which are uh, not printable yet. Uh, Luz, the Luz has that's that's quite popular. The printer bot, which is uh, the one I I, I own, uh, Ultimaker, that's the m most popular probably in uh, in Europe. Uh, okay, so uh, just a quick mention for the PG 3D printer. It's um it's a Canadian Canadian 3D printer. This developed by some uh, Blender geeks. Uh, it's. Uh, very closely related to, blend, uh, to Blender to use uh, because there is a script for actually in Blender that the exports exports your design as WAV files and it uses microphone to actually control the 3D printer uh, through the microphone port. So it's really it's really an unorthodox solution. It's really really funny. Just okay. So the pipeline. Uh, so the most open source 3D printers. What you can, what do people use, especially for um, open source like the one I own, for example. So uh, you can use Blender or any other software. You, can, you don't even need Blender. You can just download the files if you don't want to design. Uh, which then you need to slice the um, slice into into like flat planes your your model, with, which then. These are instructions for the printer how to uh, on how to on how to uh, print the object. Like uh, it gives um, instructions to the extruder on how to move them the motors and then deposit the plastic. Uh, so this is the 3D printing pipeline. So like I said, you design the object, you slice the object, which produces the G code. This is the slices, and then. Uh, you need to set up some some settings, obviously, for in Slicer, which is the slicing application, uh, in order to uh, design. In order to some designs, they, redu uh, they require different different settings, basically, because uh, some items you cannot print uh, using the, the default settings, so, so to say. And Repetia is uh, just the last step. It's uh, used to uh, just initialize 3D printing and control your 3D printer. You don't need to use it. Uh, you can just use a, you can use a SD card in, main, in many of the printers. Uh, so Blender design work of the workflow tips. There's just a couple things you need to keep in mind. These are applied to all of the things you would design ever in Blender too. So the first thing, uh, the mesh has to be manifold, which means uh, it hasn't, it couldn't, it cannot have, some, cannot have any holes. So if you want to, for example, to, uh, I don't know, I'll just sh quickly show you what you couldn't print, for example, if you had a UV sphere, uh, just a sphere, and you had a, a, a hole in the, in the sphere. So you would need to fill in the hole in order to be able to 3D print this object, because you cannot have these thin, thin surfaces. Okay, and shift five. Uh, overhangs. So, for example, if you are 3D printing something, and let's say this one, you wouldn't be able to 3D print some of the. Uh, for example, this this um, inside, there is nothing that would hold up this the ceiling of that helmet. So then, 
you wouldn't be able to 3D print it so easily. In this case, it could be maybe possible at a good resolution because the, the walls would hold it. But for example, if you if you wanted to create some like horns, for example, coming off here, and uh, or something like that, and then you wouldn't be able to 3D print that. It's just not not physically possible. There's nothing to support that. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, and the slicing software can actually generate that support uh, in in many cases. So, so if for some projects you don't need to worry about it. For okay, so the the right scale for uh, you need to use the right scale while designing in Blender because it's actually it's the first thing that I when I design something in Blender. Uh, let me come back. Um, that I, the object was so tiny, I wouldn't even see that in in Repetier. So the ten Blender units is only one centimeter. It's like huge in Blender. Is the whole the whole grid in in the default settings? Okay, spoke about the um, wall thickness. Wall thickness cannot be if your model cannot be too thin because um, you wouldn't be able to print out some of the parts. If the wall thickness is thinner than twice the uh, extrusion hole of your of your 3D printer. Model's orientation uh, it's important that you orient your model so it, so it can can be printed. So uh, the, the let's say the thickest parts at the bottom. So for example, some elements you would print upside down. Um, and uh, actually, the origin in Blender is not important. Where is the origin of the object? It's just important that the the object stands on the uh, on the grid, and it's flat on the grid. If it's just off the grid, just a tiny bit, a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, this will be enough. Your printer will start depositing here uh, in the air. So basically, it won't stick, and it will just it. It's not um, not very good. You want, you might not be able to notice that the distance can be too small to actually uh, be seen. And uh, some of these things, uh, some of the these the things can can be checked using uh, a 3D print toolkit add-on, which actually checks for these um, these properties of your model, whether they are met or not. Uh, so retopologizing, you have a very dense mesh. You have to um, use some of the Blender decimate and remesh or twist to quad some of the functions. If the dense the mesh is very dense, it's very possible that it it would. The, long, the slicing will take ages, will take way too long, or might even crash. And 3D scans are not man, not manifold, so like they have holes that you have to remember to fix it, which is uh, probably the most tiresome process. Okay, so like I said, the, the communities were really great. There's hacker spaces, and there is even like a social network for 3D printer owners, which uh, is pretty much everywhere around the world. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And if there are any questions, uh, I can pass it on. These are some quick references where you can download any some of the source files for printers, or you can search them on Google. They are very they're widely available. They're open source. Okay. Questions? You can ask me afterwards on the party if someone wants to speak about 3D printing. I am happy to speak about it. It's really passionate. So I'll be on the party okay. afterwards. Um. How, how toxic are the materials you can print right now? How toxic? Yes, because uh, how toxic? Um, yeah. So the main, the most popular material I use, for example, with FDM 3D printers is uh, PLA. So PLA is uh, cornstarch. It's made of cornstarch. So it's, it's it's totally natural. It's biodegradable. You can throw it out, and it will just degrade. I mean, over time, it will just. Uh, come back to nature, so to say. I mean, it might have some additives. Some of the materials, they have uh, really bad additives. So uh, you cannot, for example, you cannot eat from it. But then you would have to consult, like, you have to see what material you buy. There's like endless amounts of these materials. And then, then there's ABS, which is like the, um, the other type of plastic. So it is a bit more, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a proper plastic, so to say. It's, uh, it's not really food safe or anything like that. But it's uh, not really toxic per se. It's, uh, well, you have to, 
use uh, your uh, 3D printer in a in an open I mean a space in a which you could I mean which has like you have window open for example you know, it's not safe to use it at your at home for example you know in your bedroom no you know I wouldn't suggest that because it uh, there are some fumes from the melted plastic especially the more okay okay thank you um, another question uh, how strong uh, is the the metal you can print so how hard is it. So uh, that depends. There's many different alloys you can use with the SLS 3D printer. I've never actually myself used a 3D print, a 3D, SLS 3D printer, but uh, that all depends on the material again. So you have titanium 3, uh, is is widely used. It's very strong, and it's actually used in the uh, aerospace industry for the engines because the design cannot be manufactured. For, first of all, plus the material is stronger. So that uh, that again that depends on the material you use. I bet the jewelry that's produced. Uh, Using 3D printing on like shapeways, I bet it's not stronger than uh, if you had it melted actual and made it, you know, proper way. Okay, yeah? thank you. Okay. And there's a session tomorrow. If anyone is uh, wants to go, it's it's quite far away. It's like 10, 15 minutes uh, by bus. There will be a uh, the session at the local hacker, hacker space. There will be some guys there and there will be 3D printing. Okay. You can speak about it with me uh, tomorrow or later on. Thank okay. you very much, man. Okay, that's all done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.